Hey, welcome to the archive packs, or as you say at the beginning of all of your videos. Ave, my dudes. <laughs> Ave, my dude. <laughs> all right. So, uh, what is actually the meaning of that? Of the Ave, my dude, or of the name of the channel? Uh, Ave, my dude. Well, Ave is the Latin greeting for hello, and the my dude thing is just kind of an internet thing. I think I said it one time on accident when I was playing a game, I was streaming or something, and someone was like, hey, that should be your uh, your catchphrase, and just kind of stuck since then. Nice. Nice. So um, what is also the meaning behind uh, Pax Romana and why you started uh, a, a channel focusing on all things Rome? Well, Pax Romana means the Roman peace in Latin. So it's basically the time from Augustus through the reign of Marcus Aurelius. There's some debate on that with historians, but that's basically it. And that was the most prosperous and safe time for the Romans. They had control of their borders. There was a lot of trade. Um, the military was at its strongest point. <clears throat> so I figured naming my channel after the most glorious time in Roman history was probably a good idea. Even though I'm more interested in late Roman history, I figured a name like Pax Romana would draw more people in. So, Okay. So what uh, actually fascinates you with the late Roman history more than the safest point in Roman history? Well, I think it's because it's really easy to read about like Augustus and Caesar and Trajan and all the victories. But what's always interested me more was the times in Roman history where the empire almost ended, but the Romans were able to, you know... Uh, sometimes not only fight their way out, but to, you know, redo their entire system and extend the empire longer. And I just think the stories from, you know, the crisis of the third century all the way through, you know, to the fall of the Eastern Empire are just the most interesting stories as far as Rome goes. Okay. Um, and do you think uh, some of the stories uh, is because uh, they were really resilient, really adaptive people? Yeah, I mean, I don't think... Um, they really had any other choice. I mean, there's not a lot of empires that lasted over a thousand years. So um, the fact that they were able to change not only uh, religions, but how they fought um, areas, capitals, um, you know, the ways that they fought, you know, in the early Republic, you don't hear a lot of talk about cavalry. But by the time you get into the Eastern Roman period, the cavalry is the most important unit. So Adaptation is the only reason that they survived as long as they did. What grabbed uh, your interest in in Rome so much so that you wanted to make a channel out of it? Well, for me, it started, I think, when I was probably like five or six. Um, my grandfather actually had a book about uh, Augustus and Agrippa, and I read it. I mean, it was a little thick for me at the time, but I read it, and then the interest just kind of grew over time. I started, you know, watching anything... Hollywood made about Rome, which can be good and bad, but uh, playing video games, historical video games. Um, as far as the channel goes, uh, in 2018, I made a Facebook page, and it's called Daily Updates on the Status of the Roman Empire, and every day I would post, it's gone, as a joke, basically. Uh, people are still waiting for it to come back to this day, but after I got like 40, 50, 60,000 followers, and I started making more in-depth posts... And then, you know, I made a Twitter account, Instagram, all that kind of stuff. I thought, why not make a YouTube channel? See how it went. I knew absolutely nothing about editing, which, you know, I'm I'm learning as I go on that. But uh, the YouTube channel took off as well. And now I just get to, you know, make videos and talk about Roman history. Nice. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I find it really interesting. Uh, I mean, they're just so it's such a unique point in time because not only do we have uh, things like the Roman Senate, which uh, exists today in American government uh, as Congress. Um, we also have uh, a number of really unique inventions, too. And uh, overall, um, this just very, you know, broad span genius. Um, so is there anything uh, particular with you that is... Um, to this day, like one of your favorite things that still exists that came directly from Rome? Well, I think, you know, there's a saying, I can't remember who said it, but if um, there's a saying in the Western world, so basically, you know, Europe and America, that if you're confused on why we do something, it's because the Romans did it. And, you know, that's basically 
everything from our system of government to our religion to our organization, everything is Roman related. I mean, I don't know about a favorite Roman thing that's still long, but just the fact that, you know, everything that the Romans did still affects, you know, 2000 years later, I think is amazing. So uh, in, there's a lot of people nowadays that are starting up um, uh, YouTube channels um, because they're also <laughs> pursuing like a way to also adapt their lifestyle. Like I just recently started a, a podcast with a guy I interviewed earlier um, this year, uh, Thor, and he's very like persistent on trying to like uncover um the old uh nordic nordic ways of life he wants to figure out the religion and we just had okay. somebody else on too who's a pagan um this guy tom rosell who uh, has a channel called survive the jive uh it's pretty interesting to see uh how people manage to like integrate ancient ways of living um has anything from studying rome uh like added to your your life yeah um well i would say you know, other than being something that I'm really interested in, so it takes up, you know, way too much of my time, um, you know, studying Eastern Roman history, actually, you know, speaking about religion, you were saying you had a, a pagan on, studying Eastern Roman history actually led me towards orthodoxy, Christian orthodoxy, because I had left the, ch the church that I grew up in and was, wasn't really in one for most of my 20s, and just, you know, reading about the Byzantines or the Eastern Romans, as they should be called, um, you know, led me towards orthodoxy, doing more research on that, and eventually, you know, joining the church itself. So that's probably the biggest one in my life. Nice. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, actually, speaking of the Byzantines, um, I know that Justinian, uh, who, funny enough, I just watched an episode of The Unexplained with William Shatner on mm -hmm. uh, disa devastating disasters. Sure. And he was talking about um, the, uh, the volcano that time, when the Justinian plague happened. Um, and funny enough is that this is to bring up the Byzantines. Uh, Justinian is someone who there are so many like hot and cold. It's just like this bipolar reaction mm -hmm. when uh, Emperor Justinian gets brought up. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on. Uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> I've, I've said before that I think Justinian is the most hated and the most loved Roman emperor. Um, you know, because with a lot of emperors, you have fan clubs and hate clubs. You have your Neros and your Caligulas. But Justinian really seems to have a group of people who think he's one of the best. He's top five and a group of people who think he's like bottom five. <clears throat> and I think that's because, you know, he accomplished a lot in his long reign, including, you know, taking back parts of Italy, North Africa, even Spain. Um, and the empire reached levels of wealth that it hadn't in, you know, a couple centuries, probably. And wouldn't again, probably ever. Um, you know, he built the Hagia Sophia. You know, he did a lot of things. But like you said, the the plague happened in that time. Um, his wars did drain the treasury towards the end of his reign. And, you know, some of the decisions he made about, you know, war with the Persians at the end led to decades of like fruitless war that just further destroyed the Romans. And a lot of people blame Justinian for the eventual collapse during the Arab invasions, because, you know, you know, both the Persians and the Romans had fought for a hundred years at that time and were just swamped by the Arab armies. So I think Justinian the Great, you know, he is one of the few people that have the great after his name, but he is truly, you know, someone who accomplished a lot. But, you know, you could make the argument that some of his decisions, especially later in his reign, um, you know, hurt the empire going forward. I think it's kind of hard to judge somebody after, you know, like for something that happened 150 years after he died, but he's definitely controversial for sure. All right. Interesting. And so uh, who are, or if you have a favorite or a couple of favorites, who are your favorite emperors? Well, I always like try to break it into West and East, but if I had to pick one, it's definitely Aurelian. Um, I think Aurelian you know, only had a five year reign, but was able to accomplish more than most emperors could in 20. And it's one of the greatest what ifs in history is if Aurelian had gotten, uh, you know, a 10, 15, 20 year reign, what he could have accomplished. But, you know, if, if Aurelian's off the table, it's hard for me not to pick Augustus 
just because, you know, he's arguably the best emperor. And then if we're going, you know, Eastern em- emperors, you know, Basil II uh, during the 11th century, I think is probably my favorite uh, Byzantine emperor. Right on, man. Right on. Yeah. Um, and so what made Aurelian uh, such a great emperor to achieve uh, so much in five years that some emperors couldn't do in, you know, 15 to 20? Well, he was a part of this, um, what you'd call like the Illyrian clique, a, a group of Illyrian generals who, you know, from the modern day, you know, Albania, Balkans area, that were generals first. They weren't uh, part of the Senate. They weren't some rich Roman living in Capua. They had been on in the army their entire lives. And when he took over, the empire was actually split into three. You know, the Gallic Empire, a lot of Spain and Gaul and Britain had broken away from Italy. The east was under the control of Palmyra. And he really only controlled the center part of the empire when he took over. Uh, he had the Danube legions, though, which are were arguably the, the best fighting group at that time. And within a couple of years, he had defeated the Gallic Empire, the Gallic Emperor, and his name is not coming to me right now, but he was a big fat guy um, in all his pictures. And then he had defeated Zenobia, who was uh, the queen of the Palmy- Palmyran Empire. And within that short period, had reconnected the entire empire and really set it up for an emperor like Diocletian and even later Constantine the Great to inherit something that was more whole and not, um, you know, split into thirds um he you know even in those five years he had military reforms which gallienus the emperor before him had introduced the cavalry which we talked about before but he used the cavalry to such an extent that the romans issue was they couldn't get there in time a lot you know the the barbarians would invade and by time the roman army got there they were gone so the use of the shock cavalry was you know to speed up the army and he was able to defeat you know large barbarian goths and uh, different German tribes that before were just running rampant and free. And, you know, he made some decisions like abandoning Dacia because it was indefensible that really strengthened the Danube borders and allowed the empire to exist in the West for another, you know, almost 200 years. I'll accept that. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Aurelian's probably the goat. goat. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, It's pretty cool. I mean, yeah, even in your videos, like probably my favorite ones are your, uh, your controversial Roman opinions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are the funnest to make. Yeah, and that covers, I mean, you really do cover a ton of content. Those are videos I have to rewatch just to cover everything a few times. And I totally love it that you're able to just kind of say it off like right on the spot, like I can just throw you in the spotlight. (laughs) That's just because I've, you know, spent way too much time obsessing over the Roman Empire. There's probably parts that I would have to do some research on to talk, but if it's Aurelian, I'm ready to go whenever, you know. Aurelian, ready to go whenever. Yeah. Yep. Um, so actually, funny enough, I have a joke uh, with some people about um, <laughs> if the Roman Empire is still alive, they they currently exist in conquering dank memes. <laughs> uh, some of the memes that have been out there, like the Aurelian drop it video. Yes, I have seen that. That is one of the best. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's absolutely hysterical how some people will like dedicate entire Facebook pages uh, so they can just come up with these really funny um, like fake events called let's tetuo uh, or no testudo uh, hurricane Ian. Yes. <laughs> it's like no, there's a lot, a lot of photoshopped of... Roman yeah, there's, there's there's a lot of... in positions for like hurricane Ian to hit Florida. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I'm curious about this. Um, even like when I was growing up, there were a lot of jokes about uh, the Romans being kind of these like deranged, uh, godless, will have sex with anything, uh, weirdos. Um, and so I'm curious, was that like post-Roman propaganda or at the time like anti-Roman propaganda? I think, I think, you know, when it comes to learning about like the, the pagan era of Rome, a lot of our sources are written by Christian Romans. So you have um, these descriptions of, like you said, orgies and, and death cults and stuff like that. And there may be some truth to some of that. But as far as, you know, the Roman pagans go, I don't think they were that much different than, you know, any Indo-European pagan culture, really. There, there was a focus on uh, sacrifice and 
you know, there was things that the Romans did during the pagan era that they didn't do uh, during the Christian era. But I always tell people to, you know, with a grain of salt, take a grain of salt with some of the sources because you have uh, Christian sources that have a, they want to destroy, not destroy is not the right word. Um, they have a, a bias is a better word against the pagans that came because at that time they were still in their minds fighting the pagans, you know, the, the Christ- Christians didn't take over in, you know, three days. It was a centuries long conflict. So yeah, I, as far as, you know, the, the orgies and the, the partying and all that, I think there's some truth to that. I mean, you know, they, they worship gods of wine and, and sex and stuff like that. But I think some of the more Hollywood type stuff is probably just that just Hollywood. It's just Hollywood being Hollywood. It makes for a good movie. I mean, you know, the Romans, the Romans did sacrifice animals like most pagans did. And there is some talk of sacrificing humans during like really extreme circumstances. But there's also sources where, you know, the Romans talk about how disgusted they were by some of the things the Greeks did and some of the things the Carthaginians did because it wasn't, you know, Roman and it wasn't very Roman. It was barbaric in their minds. So, okay. I think it depends on the era. So, I mean, you talked about they sacrificed humans in extreme con- uh, uh, circumstances. Um, <laughs> there is one, actually, what comes to mind is there's one story of they would, they would hold like a group of virgins and sacrifice them at the age of 30. Mm-hmm. The, I don't know if that's any. That the, the Vestal Virgins? Yeah. Yeah. So you have, you know, I'm not sure. The, the, the ones that I know are, the one time the Romans did it was when originally the Gauls with Brennus uh, sacked Rome. Um, you know, a time of, you know, where they were, you know, very well could have been wiped off the map. And then another time after the Battle of Cannae with Hannibal, where, you know, 60,000 Romans are killed and there's no army between Hannibal and Rome they start doing some things that maybe they wouldn't do in normal times. So it takes those those kind of situations for the Romans to consider sacrificing humans. Like, you know, one of the things that, you know, you hear about them with Carthage is they're disgusted that the Carthaginians, you know, kill babies and sacrifice babies. So I think it, you know, it, it took a really terrible time for the Romans to even consider, you know, that kind of action. Yeah. All right. So, um... Before we start getting into the last questions, uh, are there any fun facts or facts you think get overlooked uh, with Rome that you'd want? Um, yeah, I mean, far, I don't know far as fun. I think one of the funniest ones probably is the the poop sponge. Um, when I read your question about the fun facts, that's the one that always comes to my mind. Um, you know, and when Pompeii was dug up, they found these Roman bathrooms and there's all these toilets right next to each other. And it looks like the Romans just you know, sat next to each other while using the bathroom. Now I have read some articles that says there could have been like cloth things in between. We wouldn't see that today, but that's not as funny. So there was this, you know, how did they wipe? They didn't have toilet paper. There was a communal sponge on a stick and then a bucket of water in front of you. You would use it. You would dunk it in, wipe yourself and pass it down the line for the next guy to use, which is gross, but it's a different era. Um, another fun one, um, that I, you know, I want to talk about is, uh, Emperor Valentinian. Uh, he was emperor in the fourth century and, you know, that time there was a lot of, you know, he, he ruled for about 15 years, which was long for a Roman emperor at that point. And he was spent all of his 15 years away from Rome. He was never in the city of Rome. He was on the Danube and the Rhine fighting the barbarians. And there was a barbarian group called the Quadi. Um, he had made a deal with the Quadi the year before. I can't remember the exact details, but they were kind of reneging on the deal. But they were explaining to him, you know, why they were trying to tell him. And he was getting so angry at the Quadi that he was like frothing at the mouth and screaming. And eventually, because he was so mad, he just had a heart attack and died right in front of everybody. Which I think is probably the funniest Roman emperor death. Top, <clears throat> Top death for <laughs> emperor. Yeah. And then... um you know, one of your your questions was uh, facts that get overlooked. Um, I think for me, one of the things that I hate a lot is, you know, that arbitrary um, 476 date for the fall of the empire. That's the, you know, the fall of the Western Empire. And then a lot of times people think, you know, that's when Rome fell, 476, when in reality, you know, that's when the Western side fell. 
You know, the eastern side fell a thousand years later. And I think that side gets unromanized a little bit. And I, you've watched my video, so you probably know how I feel about that. Um, but, you know, the, the Eastern Roman Empire finally completely fell in 1453, which is only 40 years before Columbus sailed the ocean blue, which is pretty crazy to think about that. Um, you know, the Eastern Romans fought with, you know, gunpowder. There was cannons. There was early musk, you know, guns, type gun that the Ottomans used. You know, and this this is an unbroken stretch of empire that goes back all the way to Augustus. So I think that's, you know, something that, you know, a lot of people, especially in the West, I think, you know, growing up, I didn't really learn Eastern Roman history till I looked into it myself. So. Cool. So, I mean, they went from fighting in caves with spears to <laughs> fighting with guns. And exactly. Full plate. Uh, yep. That is pretty cool. That's, a, that's mm-hmm. actually a really cool fact to be walking away with or full cool fact to be sharing. Sure. Um, all right. So now, uh, since you did not go to um, Pompeii or did, you did not go to uh, Rome back in um, 2020. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to share. Oh, okay. If I can remember how to put on uh, slide mode. All right. Is this from when you went? Share some of my crappy images from 2009. (laughs) I got to uh, go on a trip with a couple other students. So this is Mount Vesuvius. At I think eight in the morning. All right. Where I got to eat pizza for breakfast that day. Beautiful. And uh, they they still do have those pizza shops open. So when you go to Pompeii, you can stand there at the base of the mountain, stand there at the base of Pompeii, and eat some pizza first thing in the morning. Sounds like a good time. Yeah. <clears throat> um, here is one of the court one of the many courtyards in Pompeii. Um, I'm going to wait to share just how immense everything in Rome really is. Yeah. I'm going to save it for one picture later. It's towards the end. So for people with morbid fascination, <laughs> this is our dog. Oh, no. I know. It's like, a, it's on a display case too, like out in the open. Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> you can see a dead dog. I mean, it's interesting. It is kind of sad though. It is. I mean the whole oh, wow. the whole thing like about an entire city being buried beneath well, volcanic ash is really sad. Well, it's, it's like it's really sad because all these people died, but like our information that we would have on everyday Roman life would not even be close if we didn't have these ruins. So it's almost like you're not glad it happened, obviously, but like we wouldn't know half the stuff we do if it wasn't for Pompeii. Yeah. And I found an ancient Lego. <laughs> apparently rome was really big in the legos back then that's pretty clearly a lego I yeah think. Keep, keep your eye out you'll find some odd stones like that in pompeii yeah. maybe maybe you could do a video on that all the all the weird stones you find <laughs> the legos of pompeii yeah also go if you're gonna go in the summertime go in the morning because it's like oh, yeah. 120 degrees by like oh, yeah. 11 a.m it's ridiculous um so here's we're starting to get more inside of the buildings now and getting to see uh the architecture design which is just hands down gorgeous i mean right. all of this is made with like hand tools thousands of years ago yeah it's, it's probably one of my favorite things is just this random fountain somebody had to wash their hands in just the craftsmanship is amazing yeah it's absolutely mind-boggling to walk in even at like 14 where i didn't fully under understand or was able to appreciate right. it as i can now at 28 um that, you know that's yeah that's why like stuff like this is why i always talk about you know for some reason there's you know a lot of times people think the ancients were somehow less smart uh that's not true at all if there i mean there's no chance in hell with 10 years of training i could do anything like this so i know and they didn't have like 
they didn't have like rulers they didn't have pencils they didn't have paper right, like right. now they didn't have nearly any of the resources and somehow they figured it out just using hand tools right you know and so a lot of the things they built in my opinion are you know aesthetically more pleasing than what we build now so oh god yeah yeah um yeah, it's absolutely incredible what people used to be able to make I like this this is this is another thing you'd wash your hands in yeah that's beautiful yeah all right and now we get to the coliseum <laughs> all right the place the birthplace of stadium sports <laughs> All right. So it's so big. You, you can't even, I couldn't even get like an entire like head to toe, like standing at the base of it, right. like this area of it. Um, so anyway, that's, that's Garrett at like five, two at that's four, 14 year old Garrett. Yeah. It's 14 year old <laughs> Garrett. And to see like, it just how insignificantly small me and all these other people are right it's huge like six feet tall and he's definitely a lot closer i mean just to see how huge oh yeah yeah and they figured out how to make that i don't know if you saw the, Col and... the coliseum series this summer no i didn't yeah i didn't see all of the parts of it it was pretty fun yeah you know they figured out how to make it but not only make it but to make it so it's still standing now that's the thing, right? Yeah. So, um, so when you stand in, I mean, it, it's colossal. <laughs> like looking at the top of it. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. And then um, when you're able to look at all of the area, so this is where. Uh, I don't know if you can see with my mouse, but this is where like the boards and the sand would have been years ago yeah. back then. Um, it's kind of at like ground level, which the lower that would have been where like all the nobility in Rome would have been sitting, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, I know you had the emperor's box, which would have been, you know, I'm not sure. I've never been in there, but I do know you had better seating, you know, the more sesterce you were worth. For sure. Yeah, yeah. The plebs, the plebs were there for their bread and the circus. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you get your bread and your circus. Which it's like I went to an NFL game this past Sunday, and it's basically the same thing. I ate, you know, three hot dogs and had six beers. So I'm basically was doing the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Who'd you see play? I went and seen the uh, the Saints and Falcons down in the Superdome. Right on. Yeah. Okay. So here's a better picture. So this this is everything. I don't think oh, wow. people are allowed to go into this area just because it's unstable or not yeah. necessarily the safest for tourists to be walking through there. But um, so these are all the little chambers and everything that people would have um, been – below the floorboards the sand dripping yeah. down the hungry animals listening to the roar of the crowds uh that's where it all would have been happening in that dark and probably very smelly yeah torch well, they, they could also uh flood the coliseum i believe uh when they did when they reenacted naval battles too which is pretty crazy to think about for real they yeah. for that. wow <laughs> reenact the punic war battles <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah all right yeah, that was really cool yeah glad to have shared that with you all right yeah. so pax um my, my last two questions are uh if there is anything um you know you want for people to take away for the legacy of rome <laughs> yeah um I think the legacy of Rome really is just Western civilization altogether. Um, it surrounds us every day. And that's why I think the study of Rome is so important, not only because, you know, Rome is just cool. You know, that's why a lot of people like it, you know, emperors, legions. Um, but I think, you know, our legal system, like I said before, our religion, 
you know, uh, one of the things, you know, I learned actually not that long ago was that, you know, the reasons we do weddings the way we do now, like with the ring and the carrying your wife over the threshold, that's all Roman, you know, some of these things, is, I love connections and I love things that carry over. And, you know, the fact that a 2000 year old empire has so much effect on us today, even, you know, a 2000 year old Republic, I should say, if you, you know, if you live in the Western world, cause we model our government system of government after that. Um, that's why I think the study of Rome is more than just, um, you know, badass generals. It's that, you know, the world we live in today was completely shaped by the Roman empire and the Roman Republic. And, uh, that's why it's so worthwhile to study. Is there anything for future generations you'd like to share? Um, you know, I, the way that I do Roman history, because I'm not a, uh, PhD, I didn't go to school for Roman history. I, you know, went to school for a dumb thing that I don't even use. Um, so the way that I do Roman history is kind of through jokes and memes. And I think I'm qualified for that more than I am like, you know, giving a two hour presentation on Hannibal or something. Um, but I do that and I think it connects with, you know, younger people. I have a lot of, you know, people that message me that are fans that are like 15, 16, and that's really cool. And I think, you know, getting more kids into Roman history is important. Um, I think there is, you know, unfortunately a bit of a negative connotation with Roman history at the moment. And that's because there's a negative, you know, feeling about all empires in general. Um, you know, we all know that the Romans, you know, had slaves and killed hundreds of thousands of people like every other empire in its time. And, you know, a normal person can look at that and say, that's wrong. We wouldn't do that now, but we also aren't, you know, putting our 21st century morals on people who lived 2000 years ago. Um, so I hope that people aren't scared away about learning about, you know, Rome just because of, you know, technically, you know, you could say it about more than just Rome, you know, you, the Persians, the British empire, all these different empires did things that we hopefully humans wouldn't do today. They still do, but you know, hopefully they wouldn't, um, Hopefully they can look through that and see that, you know, it's worthwhile to just to not only study the Romans, but to um, try to think of the right phrase here. Respect's probably the wrong word, but just, you know, to realize the big effect of the Romans and that it's OK to, you know, to enjoy Roman history. All right. Thank you, Pax. Thank you.